All right, we have started the recording. Welcome everyone. Uh, it is really my great pleasure to welcome you to um, the video recording of a discussion of Editor's Choice paper for British Journal of Social Work issue 52.5. Um, it's my wonderful pleasure to welcome Su Ting Kong and Catherine Noon from Durham University. We have one author uh, absent um, due to unforeseeable circumstances, which is Jane Shears from uh, uh, BASWA, uh, British Association of Social Workers. Their paper, which is quite fascinating, and we're here to discuss it, is called Social Workers' Central Bodies During COVID-19, the Suspended, Displaced and Reconstituted Body in Social Work Practice. What a rich topic to discuss. So can you tell us both a bit more about what motivated this study? Oh, Ria, thank you so much for having us here. I think it's just wonderful uh, to have the platform to share our passion, why we do this and how we do that and why we care so much. And I think the ultimate concern at the very beginning when we started this project is that we were all hit by COVID-19, we still are. And then the disruption that COVID brought to the field of social work is tremendous. And I still remember from the university side, you saw students going out, very frustrated, very scared. And then people, they have got vulnerable people at home, they've got care responsibility for, and they are themselves social workers having that kind of moral uh, obligations to go out and to still support people. As someone, you know, teaching social work, doing research in social work, the immediate response to the situation is that what can we do about it? What can we learn about it? What's out there that we can actually collect data and then create something meaningful for the profession to kind of move forward? I think, you know, that ethos really underpins the project and all the projects related to this particular um, uh, area of work that we've been working on. And that's the reason why, uh, as we started looking, we spotted that Baswa uh, already had started a wonderful survey called Social Work during COVID-19. They collected members' uh, responses about challenges, worries, what worked really well for them and what didn't. Um, and they collected 2,222 responses nationally, right? Catherine will talk a little bit about uh, the details of it. And then with that database, we thought it, it would be wonderful if we can collaborate with BASPA to analyze the data. But at the same time, um, because Catherine and myself um, have been doing a lot of participatory research, we believe and really, really think the value of having social workers on board in analyzing data and also taking the project forward is the way forward because without their frontline experience, it's impossible to understand the depth of, of, of the um, experiences and the impact on their everyday professional practice. And I think that is the major reason why we then sought for funding collaboration and started the project Empowering Social Work during COVID-19. Um, Catherine, do you want to talk a little bit about um, your yes. participation and what motivated you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I think just completely an echo in what Shmoting is saying there, but maybe just focusing more on that survey um, we mentioned. So the initial survey that was where I came in, I think, um, on experiences of COVID-19, social workers' experiences, um, which was kind of the bigger picture. And it was a big survey, 2,222 responses. And we analyzed this collaboratively, as Shwiting mentioned, with the Practitioner Research Network. This was back in 2020, so it's been quite a while. Um, and during that, we outlined a three phase model. And just very, very briefly, it was firstly kind of chaotic change versus business as usual, which was influx of guidance, information, then questioning of doing proper social work in phase two, during what we had like procedures rethought, resources reconfigured, and then phase three, we, ha we had two pathways emerging, which was about settling for the new normal and then striving for the new the better normal. And I think it's on that vein where we started to reflect more about enhancing the experience of practitioners um, and started to think in more detail about the future of social work essential bodies. Um, and as well, you have to remember that there were no questions focused explicitly on this issue in the original survey at all. And yet social workers chose to reflect on this and include a mention of how their bodies were being impacted by COVID-19. So it sort of became obvious, I think, 
looking at these emerging responses, look at a literature gap as well a little bit around the issue that this was something that warranted further investigation. And I think just considering how we're going to move forward for this better normal, this is clearly an important issue that we need to take forward. And very, very glad we did because it's, yeah, it was very, very rewarding. I still remember there was an example, wasn't it? Um, in the network, we always talk about the difference between walking into someone's home and walking with people out yeah. there in the garden or in outside space and how we reflect on the you know, that kind of like power difference between social workers and surface users that has been always there and didn't think hard enough how we re-engage our body in practice to change that. I think COVID actually brought a very mixed picture to, to social work practice. And that is from there, we see body as an opportunity. Mm. And you summarized briefly in the article what, um, how professional practice and research has so far engaged with the essential body of social workers in practice. Can you say a bit more about what your findings were when you looked at what literature is already available on this? Yeah. Shall I start with uh, why uh, after after kind of like working with the network to produce a report uh, 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 in this project, uh, why we think body is so important? Because we have seen COVID has changed the way social workers see, smell, touch, hear and taste. You're in the house, you can't really taste anything now because you've got the mask on and also you don't actually touch anything. We talk about the lack of um, transitional space, for example. We don't share cars with colleagues and then we don't have the space when, when, when we actually reflect. Uh, Harry Ferguson's paper always talk about that transitional space. Um, we didn't have it. it, it was lost because you don't share the car anymore. From one place to another, even you do the visit, that space, was closed and also the way people actually talk to people with the mask on create different sort of like barriers of accessibility and also the feeling of having a relationship with people that is one area and then we look at the literature we saw that actually most of the literature when they talk about social workers body it's about burnout it's about building resilience we talk a lot about that but we don't even understand how the body helps social workers to practice uh, on the site. And so we particularly look at how touch uh, and also body is considered as contagious and bad body, bad touches when uh, during COVID-19, the, the, the perception of body has changed. The way we use our body um, uh, has changed. And also uh, we feel like actually we haven't got enough understanding of how the body has been shaped by COVID and what kind of good practice or not so good practice might have emerged. And that's the reason why we start looking at it. And Catherine, uh, can talk a little bit about the findings. I yeah, think. before we proceed to that, I mean, yeah. I don't know, it's an international journal. Yeah. This study focuses on the UK context, but also mm -hmm. in terms of, you mentioned touch, culturally, touch and what is a good touch and bad touch yeah. in relation to in the context of professional practice can differ so hugely. I certainly as a Slav working and living in the UK, I had to learn how to constrain my <laughs> hands, which still when I talk, I'm not necessarily <laughs> under control. But you know, when we talk about international context and culturally yeah. what is considered appropriate in terms of our sensual bodies and how we embody in, uh, our space or, or how we relate to people we work with, then it becomes a much more diverse picture. Did that come across in literature? Is that touched upon anyway in relation to considering how across cultures that might differ? That is so interesting because when we look at um, uh, uh, the literature, it doesn't actually talk a lot about how body is appropriate across culture. I think that is the reason why we started doing um, a cross-country comparison oh. later on in a small project Catherine was involved in. Um, because we start to think about actually body is differently trained in different cultures and also uh, in different professional cultures of social work. Because social work, although it is an internationalized um, or, or internationally recognized profession, but then when it is contextualized in the politics history and social contest and cultural contest, the way we practice is actually quite different uh, mm -hmm. in many different ways and it serves you know, different purposes. You know, some in some contexts it could actually to serve more social control purposes, some of them not. But then how body plays a role 
and also how body is appropriated in a way that might actually speak to more social control, we then had a little bit more understanding in the other small project, which is about uh, social worker during COVID-19 in Hong Kong and in the UK. And definitely social workers talk about how they become, uh, how they had to add authoritatively in order to force colleagues, you know, to present a vaccination certificate uh, in order to continue to practice. I think that that kind of like ex expose how body is the site for political agendas to be received and enacted and resisted. Um, so yeah, so we didn't see a lot in the literature, uh, but when we presented this in the uh, European uh, uh, Conference of Social Research, we actually had Italian colleagues talking to me saying that, yeah, we had to stop ourselves hugging people. Mm. But it's just so impolite when you actually engage with those who are senior in the culture. And, and that is really hard to understand. Yeah, absolutely agree with you. But in terms of literature, we didn't see a lot. And mm. hopefully that's more. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, definitely a gap to, to in which we wanted to build on. Catherine, do you want to tell us a bit more about what, what the findings were? When, oh, actually, I uh, just before we proceed to the findings, yeah. if we could touch upon because what you engaged in was secondary qualitative data analysis, yeah. so it was a secondary analysis of the available survey data. Yeah, do you what because it's not that common, some other social sciences do a lot of secondary analysis of existing survey data, whichever sources there may be, whether national or otherwise. Can you say a bit more about using that methodology and why it's important? Yeah, yeah, no, so it's secondary qualitative data analysis, basically looking again at that 2,222 responses, so that big survey, and in that we just looked for a mention of social workers, central bodies in any way, um, I can't remember the exact list, but it was things like taste, touch, you know, that whole list. And, you know, in terms of benefits, that's practically very time efficient, I think, when you have so much data that social workers have given their time for, you know, explaining these things, you can come back to it quickly and look through it um, and in a very organized and efficient manner and get those answers very quickly as to is this something you we need to continue having a look at or is this really not an issue and we've maybe looked too far into it but then of course because because the original survey data didn't have the specific questions the responses were challenging to um analyze really i think um obviously we were still able to and, and there was lots of meaning and learning to get from that but you know the the confusion and the anxieties social workers felt about these issues were really present in these responses so it was quite difficult to organize them but obviously we did and that was wonderful um, and we can kind of go through those findings in a minute but yeah, we took that interpretive approach that kind of brings together what we know about practitioners themselves to this analysis. And we had 280 responses um, submitted by 176 social workers. And this was all during the first UK national lockdown. Um, I was thinking, Catherine, yeah, sorry, go please. On. Sorry. <laughs> no, go on, please. No, I was just thinking, Catherine, do you want to uh, talk about how, how, how you uh, and and us find um, the network experience useful for us to make the interpretation and involvement of uh, social workers in 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 the analysis and writing of the paper. I think that is something that we try to kind of overcome uh, the uh, deficit of academic, you know, uh, in terms of our understanding and experiences in making those interpretations. Yeah, absolutely, and I think because kind of what I mentioned about mm -hmm. the responses themselves being sort of confused in, uh, in amongst other things, uh, and that being kind of complicated, taking that back to the research network that we have, the practitioner research network that we have, we were able to split into groups and really go through these. Um, and because it was a smaller group of responses, we could be more intimate, I think, with uh, where we were going with them. And, it just completely changed the narrative of where we were going. Because obviously, I think for me especially, um, 
you know, I just looked at the literature. Um, so I had a specific idea in my head about what this might be like, looked at the data, but then being in a space with practitioners who were able to say, oh God, this is, reminds me of when this happened to me. And they were able to just add a whole new dimension and understanding to that. And that was just so, so important for how we moved forward with the data. Um, so I think that there's definitely a strength to um, this approach, yeah. How did you find the socialists? How would they approach to kind of join this group, which had then had a chance to uh, get involved in the analysis? <laughs> shall we shall, uh, we probably missed that at the beginning because uh, as part of the empowering social work during COVID-19 project funded by ESRC IAA and BASWA is the co-funded project uh, so we actually set up the first BASWA UK social work practitioner research network we have run this network for more than a year now and uh, we have got regular meetings uh, but in this particular project uh, we have got a special design uh, for supporting and developing this network uh, we created a network by sending out um, invitations to members of BASWA and then we met the first time explained the project invite the people to continue to you know work with us and then we had some CPD sessions on collaborative practice research and uh, we look at how we do that cultivate capacity for Durham academics as well as practitioner researchers to come together to work on data and tailor those sessions um, as, uh, in a way that speak to the type of data that we are having. So we had that um, phase to begin with, then we co-analyze data together. So basically at the point we were analyzing the 280 uh, entries about particularly about body, we had been working together for uh, quite a long time mm -hmm. and touch on this topic. Um, at different points of our collaboration. So that is how we get social workers. And please do join us in the yeah. network as well. <laughs> Excellent, that's what I was trying to open the space for. So for any practitioners interested in research, join yeah. BASWA and, and find out about the Practitioner Researcher Network. Uh, and you can feel free to get uh, in contact with Suteng yourself, yeah? Yes, absolutely, wonderful. and Jane Shears as well. And Jane yeah. Shears, wonderful, thank you so much. Last, you know, finally, to move on to the key findings and kind of a bit more information about them. So, what were the kind of key? What's the key summary without revealing too much? What's in the article? What are the key highlights in terms of findings? I think we can kind of jump through the probably the three main uh, findings. That's probably the most helpful way of doing it. And starting with the suspended sensual body, um, and this relates to social workers' bodies being disrupted in the sense of their professional sensing and use of sensation. So social distancing measures prevented social workers from you know, immersing their bodies in the environments of their service users. And in this context, we were looking a lot about that missing, missing of cues um, and especially nonverbal cues, um, like observing an older person in their home environment, seeing how a child relates to foster parents, those types of things. And also, also um, instances of sensual overload for those social workers who were still able to do the face-to-face, -face, um, they reported actually feeling disrupt distracted by this focus on maintaining the two meter distance, having to sanitize regularly, you know, all these extra concerns we had. Um, also impact on peer support practices, uh, working from home, kind of reflecting on being unable to process experiences in the same way. And yeah, I think social workers outlining this range of senses and spaces, they were typically engage with on a visit when completing an assessment or something like that and how the sensual body subsequently became suspended um, is, is that <laughs> in, a, in a very quick uh, bubble. Uh, the displaced sensual body is then kind of a nod to the sensual uh, social worker sensual body being displaced from the work environment uh, and relocated to their own homes in most instances. So they were one body in many worlds in, in the sense that they were in two places at once uh, and sometimes more than two, impacting how social workers could sense, make sense of their service users' needs. Um, and this resulted in limits to emotional engagement with colleagues. Um, so things like WhatsApp just weren't the right space to offload and connect in the way they wanted to. Um, and then, yeah, feeling stretched across these multiple worlds. This, we had many social workers who were also caregivers and they literally have to be 
at, in the room looking after their child whilst virtually being present, engaging with a service user. So really, really difficult. And then the reconstituted sensorial body um, related to how social workers altered their way of sensing and utilizing sensual engagements at work. So thinking about social connection, empathy, social justice, sometimes this was positive um, and enabled more informal engagement, like we mentioned at the start, walking alongside someone rather than into someone's life, but also obviously strained opportunities to empathize, feel empathized with, um, and even social workers having to sort of question the validity of what services were telling them. That was a lot to do with COVID and people saying um, they couldn't visit and that type of thing. Um, yeah, and the new remote practices as well, lots of instances of individuals and in institutions being less sensitive to the power dynamics embedded in the new ways of working. I think we had one instance of a social worker who was hearing impaired, really struggled to understand people who use masks, um, completely restricted and changed the way they were connecting. Uh, and there was just no support there for this, uh, for this social worker despite the commitment to anti-oppressive practice. So yeah, that's in a nutshell, in a nutshell but you can obviously read more in the paper. Absolutely, thank you so much. And what were your own and within the broader group with practitioner researchers, what were the key implications for the findings, whether to develop your subsequent work or more broadly for practice? I think we we discussed the paper as well as like further work with the network. And one of the many focuses is actually on what do we actually mean by hybrid practice? Because it can mean very different thing in different contexts. Because in general, we are talking about the mix of digital or remote practice and uh, in-person practice. But it can be like um, you know, rotation of going back to the office, how many days, how we do that, and then the shapes the way we, we relate to peers and how much we can share and reflect together and understand each other's emotions and support each other. It can also mean like we kind of put all the meetings in digital space to save time and squeeze more meeting in, but then there is also impact on the body and the overloading of your day, like skipping meals, etc. So when we understand understand hybrid practice, we think like we need to really understand how body is ha actually having a place in it, how body is featured in different types of hybrid practice and how body is affected by it. And then how that can then maybe um, jeopardizing the way we think, you know, professional values can be practiced in, in our field and also maybe supporting creative practice as well. So the message that we have learned from analyzing data is that hybrid practice is not essentially bad or good. Uh, it is both en enabling and limiting, but it and, and that's why we learn from, you know, the literature, they talk about the anticipation of what works and what doesn't. But what is that anticipation if we do not understand how the body is responding? I think that is one of the many lessons that we would like to, we have learned and would like to kind of pass on. Excellent. And as you're talking, also considering the implications for people who started studying practice during COVID or who are newly qualified and started their first jobs in social work during lockdowns and through hybrid working it feels also that across the life course of a social worker professional life course it, it's something that is um can affect people very in very different ways it's a really fascinating work and i would encourage everyone to uh, read it because of course the editor's choice papers are open access as are many others and all the covid papers also are in, uh, open access within the journal as somebody who's very curious about what social workers and uh, what our colleagues are doing currently, what are you two currently up to? Catherine, we had a really good discussion. So what are you currently up to? Shall I go? I go yes, yes, I, I'm, uh, it, in the writing up phase of my PhD, um, which is a participatory action research project, working with a day centre in the northeast of England, a day centre for older adults, and thinking about the role of the day centre in relation to experiences of loneliness. And so it kind of sits in a lot with the current discussions and 
advancements that are happening with social prescribing. Um, so it's really, really interesting. And I'm hoping um, I can get some different types of work out there from that once it's written. Wonderful. We can't <laughs> wait to see it. <laughs> and hopefully also have it in the journal as well. <laughs> Wonderful. Good luck. Good luck. Um, I'll be looking forward to see that. <laughs> yes. Uh, so Jane, what are you currently working on? Um, we've got, um, we have just completed a very small project, um, just like what I said, it is to compare uh, social workers' experiences during COVID-19 in Hong Kong and in the UK. We use a practice diary. Basically, we invited social workers to um, to keep a diary, um, it could be in visual form, it could be like a textual form, like writing a diary, uh, keep it for a week. And so that we analyze a week of their practice and reflection to understand what it means by hybrid practice in different places. It's a very small project. So we are still using the same model of co-analyzing um, the, the practice diary through and through in our project and uh, we had uh, we had the presentation um, in a national conference fairly recently so that is what has been completed and there is another project which is also something that we are quite excited about is called transnational social work um, so that is basically because i've got a british academy and wolfson fellowship to look at hong konger identity as well as how they seek help how they build their network and community as they settle in the uk so it's like a big number of uh, hong kongers coming to this country um, among them there is a big group of social workers qualified in the U uh, in in Hong Kong, and they have and will be coming to the UK to practice. So we would like to look at um, uh, transnationality, basically how they bring their experiences in Hong Kong to this place as they settle in professional practice. What are the barriers and what are the um, sort of like new insights that they can bring to social practice in this country? So that is another project uh, collaboration with BASWA as well as part of the collaboration with the Social Work Practitioner Research Network. So please join us. Amazing. <laughs> developing. So there was lots of really interesting development. It's where BASWA is collaborating with yourselves and others on practitioner research. So please contact either Sui Ting or uh, Durham or uh, Jane Shears at BASWA if you're interested in these developments. It's been an absolute joy and pleasure to talk to you both and to find out both about this article and about what you're currently up to. Thanks ever so much for sticking with us until the end of the recording. I hope you found it as enjoyable and pleasurable as I have and, and um, I hope to see you again soon. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>